Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our uh, free webinar session today. Uh, our session is on testing for gluten and allergens, why do it, and how to do it well. So today we're going to have uh, two guest speakers talk about gluten and allergen testing. Emily Kaufman from Import LLC, who is a distributor of uh, allergen and gluten test kits. And then we have Lauren Steinbeck from NSI Lab Solutions, who's also going to chime in towards the end. Um, those that are in the microchemistry area, NSI Lab Solutions has been around a long time, so you might be using those that company for your proficiency testing, but we're going to focus today on gluten and allergens. Next slide. Uh, I'm Tracy Serzin. I'm the president of PGLA, and I'm, I'm here to support uh, this webinar with, with Emily and Lauren on this particular topic. Um, today, we're going to talk and focus on why tests for allergens, gluten, what are those requirements that are out there, whether they're regulatory or customer-specific or standard-specific. They're also going to talk about some challenges associated with these tests, such as sensitivities, preparations, some things surrounding around proficiency tests. And then we're going to have some time for some questions and answer sessions at the end. Next slide. Just some webinar housekeeping. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. So if you uh, don't have the opportunity to stay the entire time or you want to share this recording, it will be available on our website and on our channel shortly after the conclusion of the session today. Um, if you haven't noticed already, everyone is muted for this session but you will have the opportunity to chat or ask uh, questions. Um, you, can be, you can use the questions toolbar right there on your right side, and we will get to those uh, at the end. Uh, feel free if you have something that comes up or comes to mind during the session. You no, know, uh, you don't have to wait until we ask for questions. Please feel, feel, to, feel free to go ahead and put those in at any time. Next slide. Okay, so first I want to introduce our presenters today. Uh, so first we have Lauren Stam Stainback from NSI Lab Solutions. Uh, she is the Global Product Manager for NSI Lab Solutions, has 18 years of experience in clinical and analytical laboratory science, and is formerly the Forensic Lab Director now, uh, working with NSI for the past six years. So thank you and welcome, Lauren. Uh, next we have Emily Kaufman. Um, founder of Import LLC since 2011 with the motto, more safe food, more happy people. Uh, although originally focused on developing the gluten tox line of rapid tests, she has since expanded Import's catalog to include both ELISA as well as rapid tests for additional allergens and other food safety concerns. As someone with restricted diet herself, she takes great pride in helping to ensure consumer safety. So I'd like to welcome both Emily and, and Lauren uh, to, our, to our webinar series today. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Emily to start our presentation. Thank you, Emily. Great, and thank you so much for that intro. I'm gonna uh, apologize in advance for people may hear a small toddler in the background. Um, now that I've said that, I hope that you won't, but let's see. I'm going to skip ahead my first few slides since, Tracy, you already covered that. Um, and just to get into our topics a little bit, today I want to give a little bit of background on why it is that we have to care about gluten and allergens in the first place, uh, both from a health standpoint and from a legal and regulatory standpoint. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between the definition of an allergen, the definition of gluten, um, and the laws surrounding those foods uh, between Canada and the United States, and try and help, uh, I'd like for everyone to understand a little bit the mindset of your customers, the food manufacturers, why it is that they have to think about this, why they might be doing on-site testing for food allergens or for gluten, and why it is that they might be turning to you for additional, um, additional allergen analysis. And then we'll have a little bit of time to talk about the broad categories of test kit that are available and their strengths and uses. So moving right along, why do we care about allergens? They are a big health issue is, is the short version. Um, about 10% of the population of the United States and Canada has food allergies. Um, and while not all of those allergies are 
um, extremely severe, enough of them are severe that in the United States, someone is sent to the ER every three minutes with a food allergen reaction. So that's, a, I think, a pretty stunning statistic. Um, and even though the population directly impacted might only be about 10%, when we think about sharing a household and needing to be careful in your day-to-day -day decisions because you live with someone with a food allergy, uh, one estimate for Canada is that about half of all households are impacted by food allergies. On top of that, we have celiac disease, which is a, a disease where symptoms are triggered by exposure to gluten, wheat, barley, and rye, uh, which is about another 1% of the population. And then on top of that is an additional sizable portion of the population who do not have celiac disease, but who need to avoid gluten for other medical reasons. And whether we're talking about celiac or food allergies, it's important to know that the only way to manage these diseases is to avoid the foods that you have uh, a problem with. So there's there's not really a cure that we can point people towards today. Um, and if none of that matters to you, that's all fine and good. Uh, another reason to care about them is that the market for food allergen testing in North America, by one estimate, is already well north of $700 million, and it's only growing over the next five or six years, it's estimated to reach right around a billion dollars. So we'll talk a little bit about the labeling laws that have come into play over the past 15 years or so. Originally in Canada and in the United States, legislation was introduced to require food manufacturers to make it very clear on their packaging if there were any allergens in the product. And when I say any allergens, I really just mean each country picked a couple of allergens that, that were indicated as the most uh, common allergens in their country. And so those major or priority food allergens, the original law said, okay, if you have one of these in your food, whether it's an ingredient you're putting in or it's a sub-ingredient of a sub-ingredient, it needs to be called out clearly um, and in a very specific way so that anyone who needs to avoid that food can recognize that very quickly. So that's great, and that helped a lot of people, but it didn't really do anything to address the question of accidental, unintentional cross-contact from other allergens. So with FISMA and then with the Safe Foods for Canadians regulations up in Canada, uh, that, I don't wanna call it a loophole, but, um, but that exception was really tightened up. So with the passage of these additional regulations, facilities now also have to care about that accidental trace amount of allergen that they don't intend to have in the food, but that could still very much be there and could still very much cause a health issue for someone with a food allergy. Um, allergens are considered a hazard. Anything that is a hazard under these regulations requires preventative controls. So in other words, facilities now have to go out of their way to look for well, how could an allergen make its way into this product without my putting it there on purpose? Um, and once they find those ways, they need to figure out how to prevent them from happening. It's also worth noting that these regulations do not have, and gluten is an exception, we'll talk about that later, but other than that, there's no acceptable part per million threshold that people are working with. So any amount of allergen from a legal standpoint is a problem. And these regulations also greatly expanded the need for documentation, um, for paperwork, for plans. Essentially, if it isn't documented, it isn't done. So the allergens that we're talking about, as I mentioned, they're not quite the same. Uh, and I did try to draw a Venn diagram, but it did not work. So forgive me for that. Um, in both Canada and the United States, allergens include wheat, soy, crustacean, peanut, milk, fish, and egg. And as of January 1st, 2023, the states will join Canada in monitoring for sesame as well. Both countries care about tree nuts, but the nuts that are covered under that category are a little bit different. So in Canada, there are nine specific nuts that need to be monitored for. In the United States, those nuts, as well as many more, fall under the umbrella of tree nuts. The most notable additions are coconut and chestnut. Um, on the flip side, there are additional allergens in Canada, mustard and mollusk shellfish. And then when we get to gluten and sulfites, things get a little bit complicated. So sulfites, we're not really going to have time to talk about today, 
um, but I mention them here because they are covered under Canadian allergen legislation. Although they are not strictly an allergen, the symptoms that they cause in people who have a problem with sulfites are very similar, can also be quite serious, um, and so they do need to be labeled um, if they're over 10 parts per million in the product. And in the United States, while they are not considered a major allergen, they do still need to be labeled and they can still trigger a recall. Gluten is also handled a little bit differently. In both countries, the, um, the threshold for an acceptable amount of cross contact of gluten is 20 parts per million. In Canada, gluten falls under the priority allergen framework, but in the United States, gluten is a voluntary label. Um, so you don't necessarily have to care about it in the United States unless you want to, but if you're selling your product or your customers are selling their product in Canada, then they do have to care about it. Uh, and as a reminder, gluten comes not just from wheat, but also from barley and rye. And conversely, wheat does not always contain gluten when we're talking about ingredients that your customers may be using that may be derived from wheat. To address those labeling laws a little bit more, there were really two, um, two stages of the legislation. Initially, um, we got the majority of the rules in 2014, uh, which explained that gluten labeling is voluntary. However, if you're going to label a product as gluten-free, it must have less than 20 parts per million of gluten from wheat, barley, or rye. And if there is any detectable gluten, it must be from unavoidable cross-contact despite you're having a good plan in place and not because um, one of your manufacturing clients included an ingredient that they knowingly, that, that knowingly had a small amount of gluten in it. And then in 2020, additional guidance came out uh, clarifying that distillation was an acceptable method of um, making a product gluten-free. So as long as the distillation was followed, it was done properly, uh, then the finished product would have no protein in it. We can test for protein, so we can prove that a an item that has been distilled from a gluten-containing grain can be safely, uh, you know, labeled as as gluten-free. However, items that have been fermented or hydrolyzed, it, no such no such luck. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But because there's no great way to reliably, consistently detect traces of gluten in products that have been fermented or hydrolyzed, the FDA has decided that if an item has undergone these procedures, the manufacturer must be able to prove that all of the components were gluten-free before they underwent fermentation or hydrolyzation. And there is no exemption granted for products or enzymes that have been grown on gluten-containing media. So that regulation is only about a year old, but, um, but it is very much in force. Uh, so we have these health and, and public safety reasons. We have these legal reasons. Um, and, and what they all boil down to is that your customers wind up needing to do quite a bit of allergen testing. They need to check their incoming ingredients. They need to check their environmental surfaces. They need to check their finished product. And some of that they can do on site but oftentimes they'll also be looking to you for third-party lab analysis. Uh, now that may be because they just prefer it. They just like putting it on your plate instead of theirs. It may be because they're working with complicated matrices that they don't feel confident they can adequately test for in-house. They may need to confirm the results that they got with their on-site test or get a quantification on a qualitative test that they did in-house. Um, or they may just be doing an annual validation of the methods that they're using. And again, we talked about how important documentation is. Uh, they may just need your help making sure that all of their documents are in line. Uh, so before we get into talking about all of the different um, types of test kits that are out there, I just wanna briefly touch on what I, what I mean when I say challenging matrices, and Lauren will talk about this more at the end, but um, it's important to keep in mind that if you decide to bring on allergen testing into your facility or to work with Tracy and her team on adding allergens or gluten to your, ISO, uh, your isoscope, um, it, each kit will have a slightly different set of strengths and weaknesses. 
that'll be the case from a test for one allergen to a test for another allergen, from one style or format of test kit to another, and also from one manufacturer of test kits to another. So it's really important that you read the manual um, incredibly closely and that if you have any questions, no matter how small or silly, that you talk to the person who you're, you're buying the kit from and make sure that you're buying those kits from someone who really is willing to go through with a fine tooth comb and help you identify problems that, uh, that you might see and ways that you can troubleshoot them. So if you're doing this testing and you get a new TU matrix, um, think about running a validation as you run the samples for your customer so that you can present them the results with extra confidence. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide some of the indicators that might give you a bit of a, a red flag and say, hey, I need to go back to the manual, maybe give my supplier a call, see if there's something that I should be doing as I prepare this sample. Heat, fat, fermentation, pH, salt, um, tannins, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so now we'll get into the different types of test kits. The first one, uh, this is the test kit that we at Import LLC work the most closely with, are your lateral flow devices. So these are almost always what your customers are going to be using on site. Um, and the reason for that is that on the whole, they're generally going to be quicker and cheaper and easier than any other type of test kit if we're talking about kits that look for one specific allergen or just for gluten. Um, what's nice about lateral flows is that you can take a single test out of the box and just run that one test and it'll give you a yes or no answer for the most part. Again, there are a lot of kits out there that a lot of people make, but by and large, what you're seeing is either gonna be one line, two lines or three lines, depending on the particular format of the LFD. Um, and you'll get either absence or presence, or in some cases, you'll, you'll get an additional line to indicate a, um, a very high positive. So these are great for day-to-day -day use, uh, screening incoming, incoming facilities. When we talk with food manufacturers, we talk about these as their traffic lights. They help you know if you can keep moving on the way that you'd like to, or, or if you need to slow down and look around. Um, and again, as I mentioned, each kit has its own strengths and weaknesses. Not all kits are the same. So if you are trying to validate something that's happened for your customer on site, it, if it winds up being a tricky situation, you may wanna to talk to them about their LFD and how they're using it. Um, and you may also decide that it makes sense for you to bring LFDs on in-house to do some initial screening before you do any other type of analysis. Um, however, the type of analysis that most labs find their customers are interested in are ELISAs. Um, and I'm sorry that this slide is a little bit jumbled, but, um, but ELISAs are by and large far too complicated for a food manufacturer to do correctly on site. Um, you can see a, a loose set of steps for a sandwich ELISA on the bottom there. Uh, they, the kits come, if you're not familiar with them, with a bunch of micro well trays um, and various standards and solutions. And the process is not, um, I would say it's not a terribly scary process if you're already in the lab all day, every day, but it's quite overwhelming for a quality assurance manufacturer at a small to mid-sized facility. You can see the list of typically needed um, lab components on the right there. So there are ELISAs in a couple of different formats. Most commonly, we'll see sandwich ELISAs, which require two epitopes in order to, um, I'm using air quotes here, to capture the allergen in question. Um, and in general, what's great about ELISAs is that because you'll be using a plate reader, you'll be able to get a quantitative answer uh, within range. And then if you dilute, you can, of course, increase the range. And you'll generally have a lower detection limit than the LFDs that your customers might be using on site. What can get a little tricky about these is that they're only really cost effective uh, when you're running multiple samples, both because of the time that it takes to prepare everything, um, but also because in order to get results, you'll wind up needing to run a set of standards and that takes up space on your micro well plate uh, and it takes up time in preparing those samples. So while the, um, the test may only take you an hour and a half, two hours, 
it's only going to really be cost effective for you to do if you have enough samples to make it worth your while. And that's why we often see labs who are offering this to their customers give a turnaround time of two, three, or four days so that they can hopefully accumulate enough peanut allergen uh, tests or milk allergen tests or whatever it is that, uh, that they're planning on running to make it a, a really cost-effective option. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about PCR. Um, PCR tests are, of course, looking for genetic material. There are a number of PCR kits out there for food allergens. Um, here at Emport, again, we primarily work with antibody-based kits, so I can talk to you about ELISA's anytime. I can talk to you about LFDs anytime. Um, PCR, if you're already running PCR for other types of food safety concerns, adding on allergen PCR is not going to be so hard. You can quantify PCR tests for allergens as long as you have generally additional steps and, and additional materials. There are a few cases where PCR is really the, um, the shining star for allergen detection. And that would be one example, a situation where there's very little protein in the allergen in question. So in Canada and in the United States, all of the allergens that are legally, um, that, that manufacturers are legally required to be aware of are, are fairly high protein. However, in Europe, celery is considered an allergen and there are no LFDs that monitor for celery. Um, there are also a handful of specific tree nuts that don't have an LFD out there uh, specific for them. And um, so in, in cases like that, PCR is really the only game in town. It's nice because it's highly specific and it can also help you identify food at the species level. So for example, sometimes we'll have customers who they know that they're getting a positive result on a gluten test, but they need to know for their own internal um, internal safety procedures, if the gluten was coming from wheat, from barley, or from rye, that's something that PCR could help you with. That being said, there are also places where PCR is completely useless. Um, uh, for example, an egg looks like chicken, and there are not PCR tests to identify milk contamination. Uh, there's also a really close correlation between a positive result with an antibody-based test and the amount of the allergen that's present in the sample because of course the allergen is made up of protein and the antibody tests are looking for that protein. Um, however, the correlation between DNA and allergens is a little bit weaker. So while PCR can be great for um, some cases, generally speaking, it's, it's not going to be the full answer to having an allergen solution package in your, in your lab scope. And I'll just take a quick moment to talk about LCMS, only to mention that it would not surprise me if we start to see mass spectrometry in the allergen detection world soon. Uh, but for now, it's mostly used in research settings. Um, samples that are a little bit complicated for all of those matrix reasons we talked about before, uh, there's great potential for them to be an, analyzed much more um, effectively with LCMS. But again, we, we just aren't quite there yet, so stay tuned on that. Um, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Lauren from NSI. Lauren, I'm going to mute myself mm -hmm. and uh, hand the microphone over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. I actually learned so much from your presentation. I always learn so much whenever we get to talk at trade shows. So thank you so much for handing the baton over to me. Um, hello, everyone. So I am in a little bit different uh, commercial space than in Emily. Our companies are synergistic. She has the testing uh, materials and uh, test kits and multiple other products, but we make proficiency tests and positive control certified reference materials at NSI Lab Solutions. So we offer the proficiency tests to help laboratories get accredited for testing allergens and we have certified reference materials so that they can batch those known quantitative reference materials with their unknown samples supplied by their customers. And they'll basically have a, a built-in control to look back at their results and gauge how accurate their, uh, their quantitative recoveries were. So I do a lot of lateral flow tests to validate different manufacturers' lateral flow devices. I also do a lot of ELISA testing 
we don't do PCR here and we don't do LCMS here, mainly because they're not as popular and widely utilized. Although I agree, I think LCMS is something that we will see much more uh, frequently in the future for the complex matrices and fermented products. So talking about our PT tests is gonna get us into the tips and tricks for success. Uh, so our proficiency tests come as qualitative proficiency tests. That way uh, labs that are doing lateral flow devices and ELISAs can both use our PTs to show their accreditors that they have passed third party ISO 17043 accredited proficiency tests and get that added to their scope of accreditation. So our PTs come in set of three. One of the three is gonna be positive. We give you 10 gram samples. That is more than enough to do multiple replicates or have multiple analysts in your laboratory perform the PTs all together. Um, and then we have online reporting. So it's very convenient. We have three studies a year. So it just, uh, you know, you can reach out to us after this webinar if you have any more questions about PTs and how to, how to start that whole process. But I mainly wanted to talk about tips and tricks for success, because as you start performing these tests, um, sometimes you're going to be scratching your head and wish that someone had mentored you through this. And so I want to serve as kind of that mentor here. You definitely want to get to know your matrix. Like Emily said, it's really important that you know, was your sample heat treated? Was it frozen? Uh, has it been fermented? Has it been uh, manipulated in another way that might affect the protein structure uh, that you're trying to detect the allergenic proteins? Um, so that's gonna be important to know all that you can about your matrix from whoever, whomever's providing you with the sample. Um, how you prepare your sample is key. This is more pertaining to ELISA sample prep or ELISA testing. Uh, whenever you're asked to homogenize a sample for ELISA um, and for lateral flow devices, you wanna make sure you do take a subsample of your customer provided sample and homogenize it thoroughly. Then you're gonna take a smaller portion of that and actually perform the analysis with that. Um, with ELISA, your standards are usually already liquefied. They're already liquid standards. So you're not actually doing any extraction on your standards. So the variability typically comes in when you're going from a solid sample to the liquid extract that you're then gonna proceed you know, further into your ELISA analysis with the liquid portion of the sample. So prepping that dry sample is key. You wanna make sure if it says use a half a gram that you use 0.5001 grams, not you know 0.6 here and 0.4 there. You want to try to keep your initial sample that you're extracting from um, as accurate as possible, and and just double checking the sample prep instructions to make sure that you are as accurate as you can be. Because if you extract too much protein, you carry that uh, forward in your analytical, and it can give you a of much more uh, variation from sample to sample um, than you would than you would think. Uh, trust me, I've performed these for years, and and I've made that mistake. And then I wondered why, you know, some of my samples said it had 33 parts per million, and I was supposed to have 25 parts per million. So sample prep is is critical there. Um, also, when it says to centrifuge to remove or to to pull the solids to the bottom of the tube so that you're drawing the liquid sample from the top, uh, it is a good idea to go ahead and centrifuge the samples, pour out the liquid portion, retaining the solids, and then homogenize the liquid only. That's something that has helped me tremendously um, and kept me from getting just wild, crazy, and accurate results with ELISA. I would love lateral flow devices for a screening tool, sample prep. Um, I think that the gluten tox assays that Emily's company provides are great. Um, I had no learning curves with that whatsoever. It was one of the easiest lateral flow devices to use. Um, I think that probably 3M is another one that has some really easy to use lateral flow devices. But again, some manufacturers kits are better for some allergens and not others and that's unfortunately just 
that's the landscape that we're working in. Um, I have used just about everything out there, uh, 3M, Neogen, our biofarm, and uh, some of them, you know, with our same reference material lot, the same lot that went out in PTs. So we have multiple laboratories contributing data back to me so that I can see how everything compares. Uh, some manufacturers have strengths and weaknesses scattered across the different allergens. Um, I think that the more you practice with this, uh, the better you're going to get and definitely getting to know your manufacturer's uh, test kit is key. Performing multiple uh, replicates on each sample is gonna be key as well. I typically perform three to five. Sometimes I can go out to seven with things like egg and soy, um, just to be sure that I have the tightest uh, mean value and the lowest standard deviation that tells me that I have done a, a a little bit better job with sample prep. So that's where the practice makes perfect. So PTs are the ultimate test to see if you've if you really got it down pat and you can pass a third party test like that. But method validation that Emily touched upon is really going to be, um, if PTs are kind of like your side salad, your meat and potatoes is gonna be the method validation. You've got to have method validation. You've got to know that the results that your laboratory is generating um, that the method was sound, the analyst is trained properly, everything was performing as it should in the lab, your pipettes, everything. So um, method validation is where the certified reference materials are gonna come in. So you're gonna buy a known quantitative reference material. If it says on the certificate of analysis that it has 10 parts per million of that allergen present, it was actually prepared with real world allergen mixed in with a non-allergen containing solid material. So for, for our company's manufacturing purposes, if I were going to do gluten, I purchase whole wheat flour, same whole wheat flour you would find in the grocery store. And I mixed it with uh, gluten-free rice flour. And yes, I tested the rice flour with every manufacturer's kit to make sure it was gluten-free. And then we also did LCMS analysis on it to make sure it was gluten-free. And then we mix in the whole wheat flour, a certain amount of whole wheat flour into that blank rice flour, homogenize it, sieve it for particle size um, uniformity, and then package it 50 grams per jar. After it's all packaged, then I certify it. So then I make sure that I put it through ELISA testing and make sure that that material certified value is actually what we have in the finished container. So what you're receiving was verified and nothing else was done to it. So those validated results were uh, performed multiple times over multiple months to make sure that the mean value was uh, not only accurate, but also stable. So that is the, the CRM that you buy, the certified reference material that you would buy to run along with your unknown samples provided by your customers in your laboratory. That is a great way to do your method validation as well. You take that CRM material and you perform your assay with it, and then you look at your results and you compare them to the certified value that we provided you on the COA. PTs in conjunction with the certified reference materials, that is going to be a great recipe for you to have continuous assurance that the data that your laboratory is generating is accurate and precise. There's really no other way to do that uh, as cost effectively as just participating in at least one proficiency test round per year and then building in the value with your customers because you already budgeted for that annually. Other things that people have tried, uh, I myself used to own a lab business and we tried multiple things to try to cut corners and we always wound up spending more trying to do something internally than if we had just purchased once or twice a year um, a third party PT test and just performed that. So I ran a lab for six years. It was a testing lab. We Yes, we tested allergens. Um, and so that was just something that I can tell you from experience is the better way to go. 
And if you have any questions about anything I've discussed, um, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm here. Don't let my knowledge go to waste. If you need any help figuring out most cost-effective way to add the top, you know, most popular allergens to your laboratory's accreditation, feel free to drop me a line. Um, I know we have done so much with the top three would be gluten, soy, and egg. Those seem to be top egg and milk kind of go hand in hand as far as one, one part of the year milk will outsell uh, egg and other times of the year egg outsells milk, but I would say those are the top three, four allergens. Um, if I were going to open a testing lab business today, I would absolutely add um, all of those to what I offer because the business is out there, folks. Trust me. And that pretty much wraps up what I was going to talk about today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us, but I'm going to hand it back over so that um, uh, Tracy can do the Q&A. Great. Thank you both uh, so much. Um, here is all of our contact information um, as well. If you have any questions uh, for me, I know I didn't really speak much about accreditation, but if if that's something you're looking for down the road, please give me a, a shoot me an email. And then we have Lauren and, and Emily's email as well. If we have any additional questions after this uh, webinar. Okay, so if we can click the next slide. I think we might have one more after that. Oh, this is all I've got. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> all right. So first, I'm going to start with Lauren. Um, Lauren, uh, just a, a couple quick questions for you about the PTs. How many how many laboratories do you see participating in this type of analysis, this PT per year, just roughly? Um, seven to 20. And I say 20 because um, Emily actually reached out to some of her labs and they were interested. And so um, we saw a lot of uh, increase attention in the program uh, for gluten specifically but we have anywhere from seven to 20. Um, earlier in the year, we had more participation and then towards the end of the year, it does wane a little bit, but we see that with all of our PT programs, not just allergens. Everybody tries to get everything knocked out earlier in the year and I certainly understand that. Right, okay. Um, and then what are you seeing from a PT provider perspective? Is everyone within a range or are they having difficulty uh, you know, meeting what they're supposed to meet? No, I'm glad you asked that. We actually had um, a hard time trying to determine which part per million range of uh, allergen we should go with because, as you know, um, some kits look for specific allergenic proteins, not all. Um, and so we didn't want to use something that was so low, like five parts per million, and then everybody say, well, all three of the samples were negative. I would be like, no, one was supposed to be positive, and it would have been because we used something that was too low. We also don't want to use something that's so ridiculously high that they'd never actually see that in the real world in, with any you know, food plant that's uh, going to send them samples. They would be looking at trace levels of allergen, um, not like 100 parts per million or something like that. Um, so we tried to target our mid-range. So for some things that might be 10 parts per million, other things 20. And when we did that, we had great results. Um, everyone was able to clearly see a definite positive versus the two negatives. And we've had no issues with anyone reporting um, anything strange or bizarre. I will say that we had one kit, a test kit manufacturer that changed their formulation on soy and so that customer reached out to me and they said hey all three of my samples were positive and i know that's not supposed to happen so what is going on so what we did was we we gave them a no evaluation which is not a negative thing it just means we didn't grade it and i looked into it further and realized that the rice flour for that particular manufacturer's kit was causing a problem um, so reached out to the company was Neogen, reached out to them. They're great to work with. And we figured that out together and we switched and we used a different quote blank matrix and have had no issue since. So for soy, we use a specific 
um, specific blank matrix for soy that is not rice flour. It is tapioca starch. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you, Lauren. All right, Emily, uh, could you clarify what you said about wheat and gluten? Yeah, it's um, it's kind of one of those, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't necessarily a square thing. So when we talk about gluten, we're generally referring to a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. Um, and some people would make an argument for certain cultivars of oat. That gets messy. That's that's another webinar for another time. Um, but because uh, gluten can refer to the protein from these three species, um, it gets a little tricky because at least in the States, you can absolutely have a product where you go to the supermarket, you look at it, there's no call out for wheat, there's no allergen warnings on it anywhere, um, but that doesn't mean that it's gluten free. It could be full of barley, it could be full of rye. Um, and conversely, and, and maybe a little bit trickier, there are ways to process wheat to make it safe for someone with celiac disease. So the most common is that you'll sometimes see um, wheat starch, especially produced and tested and, and carefully monitored wheat starch included in gluten-free baked goods. It's a little more common in Europe than it is here, but we're seeing it more and more. And an item like that can be absolutely safe for someone who has celiac disease. It is gluten-free. However, it is not wheat-free because it has that starch in it. Um, and so if a customer is asking for a gluten test, for, for the lab to do a gluten test and they're sending you something that contains wheat starch, it's important for you to know that going in. Um, and it shouldn't give you a positive. If it does give you a positive, either they weren't getting their wheat starch from a reputable gluten-free supplier, or they were having another problem somewhere else in their facility that, that made its way into the product. Um, but you would, and, and so they could use it to be labeling things as gluten-free, but if they were to ask you to make a, a claim about wheat, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that because the product does still very much contain wheat. Interesting. Okay. Uh, another question for you. What are the top allergens for a lab to start testing for? Sure. So I think Lauren uh, covered that better than I could. Um, I, I'll say we do the most with gluten when we're talking about uh, selling kits to the food manufacturers themselves. Uh, we, we do a lot with gluten, um, and then in the allergen space, for us, almond happens to be a popular one. Tree nuts are really messy uh, because there are so many nuts that fall under that category, and generally speaking, it's not practical. Uh, much as a manufacturer might love to say, I need you to check for every single tree nut out there, um, on the one hand, there are not um, assays for every single tree nut out there, and on the other hand, even if they were it wouldn't be cost effective to, to do all of those tests at once. So it's really up to the manufacturer to figure out which, if they know they're working with almonds, they may want you to check for almond. If they know they're working with, uh, with hazelnuts, they may want you to check for hazelnuts. Um, there is one multi-tree nut assay out there, but it's not a hygiene one, so it's, it's not one that we carry. Okay. Let me just chime in there and say that we do have interest in peanut, um, but more so than that, we actually see crustacean uh, as a popular one because I guess it has such a, a significant clinical implication. So those folks that are allergic to crustacean allergen have very um, strong responses, unfortunately, um, requiring EpiPen intervention, things like that. So we do see a lot of interest in crustacean, but but we sell as far as what's most popular being purchased and what's most popular being participated in PT-wise, CRM-wise for purchasing, um, it would be gluten, then um, soy, milk, egg, crustacean. Peanut kind of goes back and forth with crustacean, egg goes back and forth with milk. So that okay. was from most to least, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay, no, thank you. Okay, and one last question. Should I be buying kits that are certified, for example, AOAC certified? You know, I think that um, there's certainly no reason not to. The, the Gluten Talks Pro that we carry 
does hold AOAC um, validation. The Allertox sticks, LFDs that we carry do not. Uh, depending on what allergen you're looking for and whether you're looking for an LFD or an ELISA, if you are limiting yourself to only kits that have been third-party validated, you may find a very small shopping list um, or, or nothing at all for some less popular allergens. Um, so I think the, the thing to keep in mind is twofold. Uh, one, some customers will have third-party certifications or uh, be accredited by additional food safety groups and they will require um, those customers to use an AOAC approved kit on site. Um, and so in those cases, the customer may have requirements of you for the type of test that you run for them. But more generally, uh, just because a kit has been evaluated by a third party doesn't mean that you don't need to carefully read the manual. and doesn't mean that it won't still have those same uh, limitations and strengths and weaknesses that any other kit might have. Um, and conversely, just because a kit has not been evaluated by a third party doesn't mean that it isn't perfectly capable of delivering reliable and accurate results. Uh, whether or not the certification is there, you still kind of are going to be best served by doing your due diligence and your validation every time you have a new matrix. I just wanted to add on to that. I concur 100% with what Emily just said. Um, I would say that with PCR, I would look for more of a national third party or an organization to have accredited it only because the more you amplify uh, something, I mean, you could you can amplify garbage and it'll eventually give you a signal for what you're trying to detect just because of how PCR works. So for PCR technology, I lean a little bit more on looking for that accreditation, be it AOAC or an equivalent organization internationally. Um, but for ELISAs and lateral flow devices, the type of chemistry involved in that, I think as long as it's been evaluated by a third party and they're willing to support you in your method validations, uh, AKA, you know, if something's not working, send you another kit, uh, send you more test supplies, things like that. Um, if you have a good relationship with the manufacturer and distributor of that product, I, I think you need not worry about ELISAs and PCRs as much. Um, they're all, they have all been working very well for us and our customers that participate in PTs. So I wouldn't limit myself to just looking at AOAC accreditation for that. Yeah, I like to, to comment just on that too. I mean, we, you know, not just deal with, you know, food testing facilities, um, you know, we're pretty heavy involved in the in the cannabis space actually, and thinking about non-standardized methods, that's that's what we're dealing with quite a bit in that industry. And there's things that I know AOEC is working on approving, proving these methods as time goes on, but it's something that, you know, 17025 uh, allows for laboratories to become accredited and develop their own validation methods and criteria to be able to test for certain certain product lines. So it's definitely not just limited to, to AOBC. It is it is common that laboratories have to could develop their own in-house methods or rely on other sources and you know validate those as they are uh, using those for certain tests. So no, I agree as well. well. We don't have any more questions unless Emily and Lauren have anything else they'd like to add. No, this was great. I hope if anyone does think of a question that they'll reach out. For he That's very literally my job. So um, reach out anytime with any questions. Same here. If anyone has any questions or when they get started with their method validations, they run into any uh, concerns or something like that, just consider tapping into the knowledge base that's here at NSI Lab Solutions. We'll do our best to help anyone with their questions. Great. Okay, well, I really appreciate both of you today um, for uh, jumping on our on our webinar series. We like to mix it up here and there and just do different topics from time to time. And uh, this webinar again is is being recorded and will be available on our website for others to hear that couldn't join today. And we will pass any questions along uh, to either of you if they come through later on. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care. Thanks, JC. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.